SpaceX may be on the brink of disaster after new reports of a big problem with the Raptor engines. The Raptor engine is responsible for powering some of the latest and greatest rockets in SpaceX's arsenal, including the Starship and the Super Heavy. In today's video, let's take a closer look at this new problem and how the company is responding to it. Can this problem be solved before the next Starship launch attempt? Raptor is a next-generation liquid rocket engine developed by SpaceX to power the company's interplanetary transport system that aims to establish an operational cargo and crew architecture for missions between Earth and Mars and possibly beyond, starting in the 2020s. The dimensions of SpaceX's Interplanetary Transport System, or ITS, are unprecedented in the history of spaceflight, calling for a payload mass to the surface of Mars in the range of 450 metric tons. Achieving this ambitious goal requires a massive launch vehicle with a cluster of high-powered engines, a propulsion system for operation in deep space, and a propulsive landing and ascent architecture for operation in the Martian atmosphere. All this will be realized by SpaceX's Raptor engine family. Raptor represents a family of highly reusable, methane-fueled stage combustion engines that will power SpaceX's super heavy lift launch vehicles for the exploration and colonization of Mars. According to Musk, ITS will incorporate a high degree of reusability, broadening the technologies pioneered by the Falcon 9 rocket and its reusable first stage. Raptor, first presented in 2009, started as a low-priority project to develop a cryogenic upper-stage engine powered by liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. By 2012, SpaceX had shifted direction in its planned propulsion architecture and Raptor's role was broadened to become the company's engine of choice for a large vehicle capable of transporting humans to Mars and beyond. Problems increasing production of the Raptor engines that power SpaceX's Starship vehicle have led to personnel shakeups at the company and a warning from founder Elon Musk that the company risked bankruptcy if the company could not resolve them. The issue came to a head in an email from Musk to SpaceX employees where Musk warned of a cascading effect of the production crisis of Raptor engines that could affect the deployment of the next generation of its Starlink constellation and overall company finances. Musk warned that the Raptor production crisis is much worse than it seemed a few weeks ago. Musk's email did not go into the specifics of the issues, but his comments likely refer to the recent departure of Will Heltsley, Vice President of Propulsion at SpaceX. Heltsley, who had been at SpaceX since 2009 and in the role of Vice President of Propulsion since 2018, left amid problems scaling up the production of Raptor. In the email sent the day after the Thanksgiving holiday, Musk said he had planned to take the holiday weekend off, but instead he will be on the Raptor line all night and through the weekend, calling on company employees to do the same. SpaceX needs to produce large numbers of Raptor engines for its Starship vehicle, whose first orbital flight could take place as soon as January. The Starship vehicle itself uses six Raptor engines, but its super heavy booster needed for orbital launches currently has 29 engines. The company is building a new factory at its McGregor, Texas test site for large-scale production of Raptor engines, but for now is building the engines at its Hawthorne, California headquarters. Musk said in July the McGregor facility will be able to produce two to four Raptor engines per day, but the company has not stated when that factory will begin operations. This has created a production crunch as SpaceX plans for a series of test flights of Starship in 2022. Musk said at the National Academy's meeting that SpaceX is planning for as many as a dozen test flights of Starship in 2022, with the goal of enabling commercial operations to begin in 2023. Musk, though, appeared to be aiming for a much higher launch rate in his email. The risk of bankruptcy is tied to the need to use Starship to deploy the second generation of Starlink satellites. The company is investing massive capital in the production of end-user terminals with a goal of several million units per year. Those terminals depend on the additional bandwidth the second generation of Starlink satellites will provide. These terminals will be useless if the company is unable to solve production issues and get the second generation of Starlink satellites into orbit. To remedy these production issues, SpaceX is planning a new $7 billion factory to help the company stick to its deadlines. 
The facility is called Starbase, and Elon Musk aims to build it into a space-focused community. It is located in Boca Chica, Texas, which is several miles east of Brownsville near the sea. The community is near the SpaceX South Texas launch site, and the company has its sights set on significantly growing its presence there. If SpaceX were to move in, take over, and rename the town, it could turn Boca Chica into the 21st century's Cape Canaveral. There are several reasons why this location was chosen. One is the road sizes in the area. SpaceX designed the Falcon 9 from the ground up so that it is transportable by U.S. interstates. The Falcon 9 diameter is 12 feet because U.S. freeway lanes are 12 feet wide. SpaceX develops all its rocket parts at Hawthorne, California, including the rocket engines. After testing all rocket parts, SpaceX transports all the Falcon 9 parts such as payload fairings, first stage, interstage, and booster stage to launch facilities separately. When all the rocket parts come to a launch facility, SpaceX assembles the Falcon 9 for launch. Unlike Falcon 9, the Starship is 30 feet in diameter, so there is no way SpaceX can transport this rocket from their Hawthorne, California factory to a launch facility. Musk knew he had to build their Starship at the launch facility. SpaceX does not own any of the three launch facilities. It currently has lease agreements and pays millions of dollars monthly to the U.S. government. Musk knew that if SpaceX owned a launch site, it would save them a lot of money. That's why they started to look for a location for a rocket manufacturing and launch facility. According to Elon Musk, occasional flights from land are okay, but frequent flights must be from the ocean and at least 18 miles away from shore, primarily because of the noise. Therefore, a launch facility must be near shorelines and must have roads. The launch site also needs to be near the rocket factory. Otherwise, transporting the rockets would be a massive cost burden. Also, the East Coast is best for a rocket launch into most orbits. It's because if a rocket launches into the East, it can take advantage of the Earth's rotation and save energy. Moreover, the FAA will never allow launching a rocket over land in the U.S., unlike in China or Russia. So, SpaceX will never be able to launch except for polar and sun-synchronous orbit from California. Also, Texas does not have a state income tax. Furthermore, Boca Chica is mostly inhabited. While developing the Starship, SpaceX realized its operations would significantly create a safety hazard for the village residents. So, Musk did the only reasonable thing. Buy the entire community! The facility is made of two distinct parts, the launch site and the manufacturing section. Both are actually separated. The former consists of different components. The tank farm consists of one water tank and seven tanks for other commodities. There are three LOX, or liquid oxygen tanks, two liquid methane tanks, and two liquid nitrogen tanks. There are also two horizontal methane tanks to the side of the main tank farm. Their exact size is not known. The water tank is just a large cylinder made up of rings of stainless steel. The other seven tanks are double-walled with insulation between them since they need to hold liquids at a cryogenic temperature. The inner tanks are built nearly the same way SpaceX makes their 9-meter diameter ship and booster tanks using rolls of 304L stainless steel. These tanks need to be able to withstand constant pressurization and depressurization over their lifespan so they have extra reinforcement. The outer shells, which are 12 meters wide, are made up of stainless steel rings and painted white for thermal and corrosion protection. To insulate the inner tanks and keep the cryogenic liquids at just below boiling point, the space between the tank and shell is filled with perlite insulation. Perlite insulation is an inorganic material with fantastic thermal properties and does not support combustion. The water tank has a capacity of around 1 million gallons of water. For reference, the water tower at the Kennedy Space Center's LC-39A has a capacity of 300,000 gallons. Each LOX tank has a volume of 1,450 cubic meters and can hold about 1,650 metric tons of liquid oxygen for about 4,950 metric tons of oxidizer. Each CH4 tank has a volume of around 1,680 cubic meters and can hold about 710 metric tons of liquid methane for 1,420 metric tons of fuel. Lastly, the LN2 tanks have a volume of 1,680 cubic meters each and can hold about 1,350 metric tons of liquid nitrogen for 2,710 metric tons. The orbital tank farm can store about 4,950 metric tons of LOX, approximately 1,420 metric tons of methane, and 2,710 metric tons of liquid nitrogen. The entire rocket needs about 1,040 metric tons of CH4 and 3,760 metric tons of LOX. 
With these rough estimates, the orbital tank farm has enough propellant for just one orbital launch, with a margin left over for possible recycling. The approximately 2,710 metric tons of liquid nitrogen allow SpaceX to fully cryotest a booster. The propellants in these tanks will flow through subcoolers next to the tank farm to super chill the propellants. These subcoolers use the temperature of liquid nitrogen to chill the propellant so that they are denser, thus packing more energy into the vehicle. After traveling through the subcoolers, the propellants will be sent through the GSC bunker and then to the launch table and the integration tower. There is also the launch mount where the full Starship stack will sit before launch. It must be able to withstand at least 74.4 mega newtons of thrust, based on the 33 Raptor 2 engine booster configuration. The mount includes important components such as the hold down clamps, the quick disconnect for the booster, and the water deluge system for sound suppression. The launch table has 20 separate hold down clamps that attach to the bottom of the booster for static fires and launches from the orbital pad. For launches, these hold down clamps will release once all the engines on the booster are at nominal thrust. To fuel the booster before liftoff, the launch table needs a quick disconnect mount, which is on the top of the table and will disconnect from the booster around T0. The QD will help provide the booster with CH4, LOX, and helium and supply external power before launch. The water deluge system will spray water onto the bottom of the launch mount and on the ground to help lessen the sound waves of 29 and eventually 33 Raptors firing at full thrust so that the sound waves do not damage the rocket or the pad. Another component is the integration tower, which has a unique piece of hardware. Mechazilla, as named by Elon Musk, is about 145 meters tall and has the job of not only stacking the booster and Starship, but also catching them as they come in for landings. Mechazilla will do this using two arms that will lift or catch the booster from hard points between the grid fins. The Starship is lifted or caught from hard points right under the forward flaps. The arms attach to a carriage that connects to the tower on the column just under the pulley at the top of the tower and wraps around the two side columns for extra support. To be able to move up and down the tower easily, there are bearing skates that the carriage attaches to on the sides of each column on the top and bottom. The QD arm will supply the ship with methane, LOX, helium, and external power before launch. The QD arm has a single actuation point connected to the tower and allows the arm to move during launch and catch operations. The extension has a claw setup similar to the top of the Falcon 9 strongback. This claw setup will hook up to the booster for stabilization. If you like this video, you may also be interested in this one, which talks about SpaceX's announcement of the next Starship launch date. Do you think SpaceX can find a long-term solution to this production problem? Please share your thoughts in the comment section below.